to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Professor Rudrangshu Mukherjee is among India's best-known historians, academicians, and authors. He has taught history at several major universities in India, Britain, and the United States, and is at present Chancellor and Professor of History at Ashoka University. He has written and edited several landmark books, among them Avarth in Revolt, 1857-58, Spectre of Violence, the 1857 Kanpur Massacres, Mangal Pandey, Brave Martyr or Accidental Hero, Great Speeches of Modern India, and Nehru and Bose, Parallel Lives. Here, Professor Mukherjee analyzes several pivots of modern Indian history and key personalities and the need to write diverse and truthful histories. Professor Mukherjee, welcome to Live History India and the Making of Modern India Initiative. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure, Sudeep. And it's a particular pleasure being interviewed by you. Thank you very much. That is very kind of you. I, I, I hope I can live up to your expectations. So here we go. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the birth or the idea of uh, India, I mean, I know it's sort of a bit of a trope now, the idea of India and so on and so forth, but nevertheless, it is an important phrase and an idea. When, in your opinion, did uh, the idea of India really emerge? Was it 1857, as uh, several nationalist his historians and national nationalist histories have been to portray it, uh, even though, of course, uh, the response was localized in many ways, uh, and vast swathes of the subcontinent uh, were untouched by 1857. But did it really, what is your take sir, on this? No, I actually think it predates 1857, uh, even though the term India may not have been there. But if you look at, say, the extent of Ashoka's empire as early as that, I mean, he is based in Kwataliputra, present day Bihar, but his empire extends into Karnataka, parts of Orissa, Tamil Nadu, Western India. So there is this notion of a geographical territory that can be administratively uh, ruled from one particular center. Uh, it is not given any name, uh, but we have references to terms like Bharat, Bharat Vasha or something like that. You know, Samudra Gupta's pillar inscription also refers to the vast conquests of his own time. And then finally, in the uh, post 13th, 14th century, uh, the Arab word Al-Hind comes into play, which is the earliest form we have of Hindustan, which later becomes India, which actually means the area beyond the river Indus for them from their side. Trans-Indus becomes Al-Hind and that's how the term begins to originate. And, uh, you know, then the British begin to call it India. It's the, the Al Hind is anglicized, if you like, into India. And, uh, but it predates 1857, uh, I would think. Uh, 1857, of course, is not referring to the various rebel proclamations that we have. Uh, not many, but there are. 2025 in number, if not more, they all are talking about Hindustan. They are not using the word India. Now, whether India refers, Hindustan refers to India or India refers to Hindustan is a problematic issue. But the rebels themselves saw their battle uh, as an attempt to free Hindustan from the rule of the Firangi. So I don't know if that uh, clearly answers your question or not, but I don't think the term India can be kind of chronologically pinpointed to a particular time. It is an idea but, that evolved. 
Indeed. In fact, this brings me directly to my next question, and it, it segues beautifully into this, uh, I think, is that, you know, because it, it's interesting you mentioned this, that how the, the rebels uh, were engaged and, and they were determined to sort of throw out a yoke of the foreigner. And yet you have in the late 19th century, you see the portrayal of some heroes, perhaps some regional heroes like Shivaji. And there was also in the West, Western India and also in Eastern India, a, a narrative against the outsider, the British as well as the Muslim, Muslim the Muslim, in some, some cases called the Yavana. Uh, that, and that narrative uh, ironically has proved so robust in some ways that much of it has seems to have carried through to the present day uh, as a sort of a living history. Uh, what would your uh, comment be on that? I mean, could you share your views on that? Please? Yeah, so, you know, this is where I think 1857 is an extraordinarily significant moment. Of course, it is a moment when a very, very large number of people and a very large portion of India, not India, rose in rebellion against the British. But within that rebellion, there is a very significant articulation that runs completely across any religious divide. This is not a battle that is confined to any religious community, be they Hindus or they, be they Muslims. Okay. They the proclamations which I referred to earlier on, they are all addressed to both Hindus and Muslims. Okay, And they are saying that this is your common battle, brothers, fight it together. Unless we fight it together, we will never remove the Firangi. So that's very important, I think, and often ignored when we write about 1857. The second is the British did try to uh, drive a wedge into these communities. I'll give you one example. Um, in Bareilly, they spent 50,000 rupees to have the Hindu population of Bareilly rise against the Nawab of Farukkabad. Okay, 50,000 rupees in 1857 is a fair bit of money. Huh? So, they failed. The Hindus did not rise to this bait of divide and rule. So that is an instance of how, how close these bonds were. And finally, the example I'm most fond of, when the British have been defeated at the end of June in Lucknow in the Battle of Chinhat, and they are now completely surrounded in the residency. On all sides, there are cannons, guns, people, and the siege of the residency has started. Parallelly, there is a move to establish a rebel administration. And the sepoys, Hindu sepoys, largely Hindu sepoys, actually raise the 12-year-old Birchis Kadar who is the son of Wajid Ali Shah through Hazrat Mahal, his divorced wife, who did not go with Wajid Ali Shah to Calcutta, lived on in Lucknow. They raised Birjis Kadar as the new king. Okay, of course, Hazrat Mahal being the regent. But when they raised Birjis Kadar to the throne, Masnad, you know what they say? They dance around him and they say, you are our Kanhaya. Hindu sepoys hailing a Muslim prince as you are our Krishna. So I think this was a, one of the most remarkable moments of Hindu Muslim unity, uh, which was lost. And then, of course, in the national movement, Gandhi. Nehru, they try to revive it. But by then, the divide and rule wedge has firmly taken root, as it were. 
the Muslim League is campaigning for Muslims as a separate entity and so on, and things get very complicated and then get violent as well. So I think 1857 is hailed and very rightly hailed as the moment when people of Hindustan rose up in arms against British rule, but they also rose up as one people. Professor, so much of this is sometimes lost in the way education seems to be designed in India. Here I'm not talking about uh, higher education uh, necessarily, I'm speaking about education in schools. And, and this brings me to the point uh, which I really want to ask you, is that, you know, is there a problem with how history is shaped and portrayed in India, for instance, in the early years of independence, uh, India seemed to be consumed with the, you know, the Nehruvian aspect of the discovery of India approach, if you will, uh, when sometimes regional history suffered, for instance, in Northeastern India, uh, regional histories and regional identity, uh, the great, great lack of that. Similarly, in the current stream of or the ongoing stream of nationalist history, it appears that uh, it seems to ignore views except for the majoritarian view. Now, and in this sort of myth and reality situation, is such sanitized history problematic uh, for history in general and to you specifically as a historian? It is very problematic. Now, okay, now we are making a critique of what you call the majoritarian view of history. Now, now we have a particular political formation which is in the majority and they are putting out their version of history. Okay, now a few years earlier, 20, 25 years earlier, uh, say up to 84, 1984, I would say, there was another political formation that constituted the electoral majority and they dished out what they thought was their version of history, right? And as you very rightly say, in both these versions of history, some aspects of India's federal nature, which the constitution recognizes, but the historians don't, the federal nature gets lost, okay? Much of our history is Delhi-centric, North India-centric. Okay, so I myself and all, I'm often surprised that after having trained as a historian from the time I was 17, 18 years old, how sometimes I'm surprised at my own ignorance about the history of South India, about the history of the Northeast. Okay, so because we were all taught from school to college to my masters, you know, North India is important. North India is the center. Delhi is important. So this is the kind of history that has been come to be taught, continues to be taught. Doesn't matter the color has changed. The, in, a, in this sense, the content hasn't changed. Okay, we are still learning a very North India centric, Delhi centric history. We are learning it and we are teaching it. Okay, so I actually welcome the fact that many of the younger scholars, unlike myself, are not writing histories of North India. You know, there is a magnificent biography of Krishna Devaraya, which has come up. Okay. You yourself have written about a episode of Eastern India, the Plas the Plassey battle. Okay. There are histories emerging of Kerala. David Shulman has written a history of the Tamils, okay? And I, I, one day I hope a person like you and you specifically, you should write a history of the Battle of Baksar, which is a much more militarily, a much more important battle than Plassey, as you yourself actually have noted in the book, okay? It's Plassey that's become a myth, but militarily it's Baksar and what happens after Baksar that is far more significant. So I think histories like this need to be written. And, you know, from a different angle, from a different perspective and from a, with a different theoretical and political purpose, the series called Subaltern Studies tried to do this. It tried to shift the focus away from elites to 
people who were marginalized in society. Okay, so a lot of the subaltern history, subaltern studies history is not North India centric. It's not about the elites. They actually looked at other areas, other kinds of political movements which were not part of the Congress or not part of the present political dispensation and so on. So these attempts have been made and I think we need to continue to make these attempts. And future generations of historians, those who are our students, I hope will continue on this journey instead of being shackled by this notion that history of India is the history of North India and all history emanates from Delhi. Well, on, on that note, let me uh, sort of uh, se sequence one of your books, which is, is, it remains a perennial favorite for many, many people, is a, is a volume that you edited, uh, The Great Speeches of Modern India. Uh, in that, I find something very interesting that you, uh, unlike, uh, you know, sort of taking a, a sort of a standard operating procedure position, if you will, of uh, just presenting certain speeches or selecting just a school of thought kind of speech. You've actually brought people who are often seen on the opposing side together uh, as reflective of a particular idea or vision of India, according to them. For instance, you, you have Tilak and Ambedkar, uh, their speeches in the book. You have Gandhi and you have Godse uh, in, in, in the same volume. Uh, and uh, you have Manmohan Singh and you have Advani, LK Advani. You have you even have Satyajit Dwe on cinema. I mean, because it, it just seems to me to be a very interesting collective of yeah, and also and ideas. Vikram Set. Indeed, indeed. Uh, thank you for mentioning it. So could you, could you share uh, as to your thinking about putting this collection together as to how you uh, felt the need and the importance of bringing such diverse minds together and and most importantly uh, deeming them important and looking at it from a very inclusionary inclusive sense I, this is fascinating you didn't reject a, a thought simply because it was unpleasant you tried to include thought so how would you uh, how, could you share your thinking behind yes. So one, one part of the thinking was what you say, that let's not restrict ourselves, let's, let's, let us be inclusive, as many voices as can be heard. And in the case of speeches, the, I deliberately choose the word voices, okay? So uh, the, as many voices can be heard of different cadences, different viewpoints, so on and so forth, okay? So that was one aspect. The other aspect that I think prevailed over everything else is which speech is interesting? Of course, interesting to me. And I assumed if it was interesting to me, it would be interesting to other readers as well. I don't see myself as an exceptional person in that sense of the word. So if it's appealing to me, it must be appealing to some other people as well. So what is an interesting speech? What makes it interesting? The occasion makes it interesting. The other thing that makes it interesting is lost in the printed word. And I note this in the introduction, as you will see that how it was delivered. Okay, so we have lost it in the printed word. Okay. The, then what comes is how interesting is the content. So we do not actually know how Swami Vivekananda spoke in Chicago. How much passion, emotion there must have been in his voice. We can imagine it. Okay. But the content itself is actually inconceivably appealing that a man in 1892-93 could think like this and tell the world that this is what India stands for. Okay, it's interesting, it's appealing. Similarly, God say, I, I have nothing but loathing for God say. Uh, let me put, it, put this very clearly, you know, and I, I, I think people who are today uh, celebrating God say are, you know, moral cowards actually. Uh, but 
it is a very powerful speech from god's point of view let's let's think it inside out okay let's not impose that's what i told myself when i was reading god say let me not impose my views on god say what had god say to say for himself and if you think of it like that then you, it is a very powerful speech so it deserves to be included irrespective of my prejudices and hatred for god say okay and similarly for satyajit ray jrd tata they were all i think they were standing for the occasion and the content of their speeches they were standing for something very interesting and i would almost say in the case of ray in the case of vikram seth in the case of jrd tata uh, and of course many others they were saying something gopal gandhi on buddha uh saying something quite universal actually it's it's not just a great speech of modern india i think some of the speeches included in that book are actually just great speeches full stop in that aspect professor you know sometimes uh, what gets lost in in the telling of history and i'm again i'll bring refer to this very book uh, what struck me again and again is the inclusionary aspect of the book is that when people speak in terms of history they they limit themselves to politics or political figures they limit themselves to revolutions or revolutionary figures or war or war like figures or warriors you know this this the thing but i mean vikram said for heaven's sake uh, and that's a intended pun uh, is that <laughs> so you'll forgive me for that i couldn't no 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 i loved it but <laughs> thank you <laughs> so but you know to bring in vikram say to bring in a ray to bring in a jyoti tata is in a to bring in a gopal gandhi on the buddha is to acknowledge that history and the the evolution of a country and evolution of a people to go beyond politics go beyond war they go beyond Absolutely. revolutions and include so how important an aspect is that and how much do you think that today there is a lack in it or do you think that or, or this lack needs to be filled and are we as a nation ignoring the sort of 360 degree approach to history we are we are i mean there's too much of politics uh i think not just in history writing you pick up a newspaper you will find it also okay in our everyday uh, everyday accumulation of history historical events politics is privileged okay that's top of the mind okay so uh somebody publishes an important book doesn't come on to the front page right but some political leader spouts some kind of nonsensical rhetoric and that gets on to the front page so politics is as i said on top of the mind there is too much of it and that is reflected in the way history is taught and uh, the therefore the way the history is learned now when i was a student and i am not talking about the 70s there was we were actually drilled in economic history if you i did my masters in jawala lal university if you look at the course there a large chunk of it was just economic history under colonial rule so in a sense i was uh educated if you like for the lack of a better word or trained not to be a political historian so many of our generation from jnu actually went on to become very powerful competent economic historian the person i can immediately who comes to mind a very close friend of mine and one of the best historians of modern india niladri bhattacharya okay who is any who is above everything else is an economic historian okay he he trained as an economic historian he need rights economic history so but this was then the fashion history also uh, is prone to fashion is a prey to fashion if you like not prone prey to fashion so and then in the in the 80s there was a 
shift towards cultural history, away from economic history. We have done too much economic history. Okay, now we are all, now again we are in the process of taking another turn where history writing is largely becoming a the writing of a political narrative, right? And uh, the other dimensions are losing their importance. But you know, I don't see this as something permanent. As I said, history writing is a prey to fashion. So it will change. And I'm sure other dimensions will come in. And as you point out, some of us are making attempts to see to it that polit his politics does not dominate uh, the writing of history or even the making of history. I would, I would, I would uh, add that. Indeed. Uh, and here, I can't help but go back to the mutiny. Uh, you made your point early on that it's difficult to, difficult to escape 1857. But I will use it as a sort of a springboard, if you will, rather than root uh, this question in it. Uh, in one of your uh, key books, Mangal Pandey, uh, uh, Brave Martyr or Accidental Hero, you, you, is the subtext of, of the title. Now, would you share? Uh, I've always wanted to ask you this. I mean, uh, for, for readers and our viewers who haven't had the opportunity to read that work, uh, could you share your thoughts about was Mangal Pandey an, a brave martyr or an accidental hero? So, uh, will you allow me a few minutes of autobiography? Certainly. <laughs> so, yes. this book was. Uh, not an original idea of mine. I had yes. no intention of writing a book on Mangal Pandey. Uh, but what was in the air at that time, you might remember it also, but there, there might be listeners who are still too young to remember that. In the first decade of the 21st century, uh, around uh, 2005, 2006, what was very much in the air was that Ketan Mehta was making a film on Mangal Pandey, which finally got made, okay? So this was being discussed, this was being talked about and so on and so forth. And an outstanding editor, she's one of the best editors I have worked with, who was then with Penguin and now with Jagannath, Nandini Mehta, who is also a very old friend of mine. Nandini got in touch with me and he, she said, hey, Rudrangshu, you are the only person who can do this book because you have worked on 1857, you looked at the records and everything. Why don't we do a book on Mangal Pandey since he was, he's so much in the air, okay? People are trying, people actually don't, we don't know anything about him. And we don't even know whether Ketan Mehta's portrayal of Mangal Pandey will be the valid one, but it will be an attractive one. So there is a chance that your, what you write and Ketan Mehta's film can be used contrapuntally, as it were. My first instincts uh, were to say, no, I don't want to get into this. This looks as if I am uh, you know, too market driven. I'm trying to cash in on a fashion or a growing trend. But uh, because Nandini, uh, because Nandini was such a close friend, I couldn't actually say no to her. So I said, let me think about it. I bought time. And then I thought about it and I said, why not? But that why not, the decision to write was actually driven by a different kind of intellectual challenge. I knew from my own researches that very little is actually known about Mangal Pandey. Okay, we don't even know where he came from. I know the internet says he came from Balia. There is no proof of that in the records. Okay, so we don't even know where he came from. Okay, so that was the challenge before me. Can I write a piece of history, persuasive? convincing piece of history that does not 
that is not based on that is or rather let me put it this way that is based on very scanty and fragmentary evidence okay the only solid piece of evidence that we have of mangal pandey the proceedings of his trial other than that we have very little about him virtually nothing so any serious reader of the book will find that what i'm trying to do is to lo locate mangal pandey in a particular context both within the sepoy army within british rule and what british rule is doing to the sepoys and the countryside okay and also a series of happenings mutinies that preceded the mutiny of mangal pandey and why they are not given importance but mangal pandey's sole action is seen as the starting point of the mutiny that is these are the questions that the book addresses so the my narrative tends to say that he is an accidental hero he really did not start the revolt of 1857 because the revolt starts in meerut bengal is an largely largely unaffected by what happens in that fateful summer from may to september october and beyond that and nobody none of the sepoys the very few speak sepoys that spoke ever referred to mangal pandey if they knew of mangal pandey's existence so to see him as some kind of a starting point i felt and i still feel is a bit of an exaggeration a bit of myth making if you like well speaking of myth making and speaking of this sort of larger larger than life portrayal of people for the sake of uh, politics or propaganda or purely convenience because it's sort of convenient to write uh, a, a person or a, a sequence i think in this case it was convenient person. because any narrative needs a starting point and John Kay who wrote one of the first histories of the mutiny did that he started this trend it was not indian myth making it is it is john kay who describes mangal pandey and i note this in the book as a fugleman the person who leads the parade you know so he is the starting point a narrative needs a beginning and mangal pandey provides a rather dramatic beginning to the narrative of 1857 so i think it's convenience in originally it was convenience then of course as nationalist writing of 1857 began to gain ground particularly with the savarkar book that was written in the 50th anniversary of the rebellion mangal pandey gets a different kind of salience and a different kind of halo if you like the halo of a hero indeed if you were to take it from the sort of myth making and the history of convenience and if you move ahead of mangal pandey if you will to other beginnings of histories and myth making and sort of create history of creation if you will uh, in terms of events as well as personalities uh, and auras rather uh, are there any to your mind larger than life figures in modern indian history that strike you in particular as being perhaps not as deserving of the kind of uh, portrayal we received uh, that these are people that need to be interrogated more these are events that need to be interrogated more e h car in his famous book what is history he coined a very nice phrase he said the bad king john theory of history okay and the obverse of that of course is the good queen elizabeth school of history so you focus on one what you think is a nasty individual in india the classic example is that of aurangzeb okay the decline of that very complex edifice called the mogal empire is ascribed to 
the policies of just one person. And unfortunately, this is a propensity that this was a tendency that was put in place by, by really an outstanding historian, Jodunath Sarkar. I mean, you cannot deny the fact that Jodunath Sarkar is an outstanding empirical historian. But his analysis of the decline of the Mughal Empire is entirely personality based. Okay. And Another group of historians, when they, what you call the process of interrogation, when they began to interrogate this narrative, they came out with a far more convincing and a far more layered analysis of the decline of the Mughal empire, which shifted the focus away from the individual to economic social processes that were at work from around the late 17th century and through the 18th century. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean there are there are figures that need uh, need to be interrogated, and the process is, I think, just starting this kind of interrogation of individuals. Gandhi is being interrogated. Akbar is being interrogated. You know, I have interrogated Nehru and Bose. Uh, you know, so uh, I think this process is on, and this is how history writing advances. Uh, we question previous assumptions, previous conclusions, and try to uh, forge different trajectories of analysis. On, on that note, on your I, own uh, subject, on your own field, Shudip, sorry to continue. Yeah. I mean, at one time, everybody thought that Clive was the maker of modern Bengal, if not modern India. Clive of India, that's how he was referred to. I mean, Clive could have been many things, but Clive was not of India, okay? By no stretch of the imagination. Either Clive for, was for himself or Clive was for of England, okay? I tend to think Clive was of himself. He was first and foremost trying to make money for himself. Okay, in the process, he did a few things that enriched Britain as well. Okay, so people like you have interrogated Clive as well and his role in history. And the what happened in Bengal in the 18th century, second half of the 18th century particularly, cannot just be explained by the intervention, the maverick intervention, might I add, of one individual called Robert Clive. So your point of uh, point about interrogation is very well taken. Uh, can I refer to another uh, something that you said? Actually, uh, I, I recall uh, you were saying this. Um, I think it was on a visit of yours to address a seminar in China uh, not too long ago, and you said that civilization was supposed to enrich life. Uh, civilization was not supposed to destroy life. Uh, as a historian, uh, could you discuss this aspect? in the context of modern India and also modern India's neighborhood. Uh, I, I mean, I really would like to see it because you as a practitioner of history, as a, as a sort of an intellectual practitioner of history, not just academ academics for the sake of academics, I really would like to ask you this because there's so many things that are loaded in the evolution of Indian history uh, and so much that is loaded into the evolution of the history of the neighborhood, which not too long ago was our collective history as well. So could you, so, uh, could you address me, this, let this aspect? First, uh, let me first place, I did make that statement, but that statement was made in a particular, very specific context and a textual context. I was trying to explicate Gandhi's Hind Swaraj. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was trying to explain why Gandhi called Western civilization a satanic civilization, okay? And then I said that because Gandhi believed Western civilization or slash industrial civilization had violence embedded in it and violence led to death and devastation, okay? 
So death and devastation is the work of Satan. It doesn't enrich life. Okay. Whereas Gandhi was contrasting that with a civilization in which, in other, i.e. Indian civilization, in which violence was not embedded and was not certainly integral. Therefore, Gandhi argued that Indian civilization has been much more longer lasting than Western civilization. Famously, he said, Western civilization in the Hind Swaraj, he said, Western civilization is a nine days wonder. Whereas Indian civilization has lasted for thousands of years. This is because Indian civilization has enriched the lives of individuals, whereas Western civilization had led to the devastation and death of individual lives. That was the context in which this statement was made. But more than the context, many statements go beyond the particular context in which they are made. Okay, so. I, I actually believe that something that leads to division, death, and devastation of individuals cannot be described as a civilizational process. But other trends, other developments that enrich our lives, not just economically, the word enrichment is because it has riches in it uh, is often sees as the increase of wealth, not just in economic terms, but in cultural terms, in intellectual terms, you know, which adds to the value of life. Okay. Uh, that is what civilization is about. I mean, would we would we describe Nazism to be civilizing or civilizational because it led to the destruction of millions of people, right? So we don't. Even in common cocktail party conversation, it will be a very outrageous man who would say the Nazis represented a civilizational process. Okay, So that's actually what I meant uh, or that's what I, that's the, the significance of that statement going beyond the explication of, of Hind Swaraj. And if, as you were saying, if we take the geogra geography of what was once India, there are many enduring, enriching aspects within this geographical cultural space. There are also very demeaning aspects which have lasted for thousands of years. The caste system being the worst of it, okay? So let's not also valorize that something that has lasted for thousands of years is necessarily and intrinsically for the good of human beings. It isn't. But there is an enduring aspect to Indian. I always use the word in the plural, Indian civilizations and Indian cultures. I don't believe that there is one Indian civilization and one Indian culture. It is not a monochrome, it is a mosaic. Okay, and these have this, Bits of this mosaic have very long and has had very long enduring lives. And there are bits of this mosaic which are terrible, but they have also had long enduring lives. The caste system and poverty being the two most important of those terrible aspects of this civilizational process. I don't know if I'm making sense. No, but it, these are complex issues, Professor, and, and, and that is why we look to people like you to, to interrogate it, interrogate precisely these aspects of Indian history and inspire others to do so. 
Uh, speaking of uh, the span that we're addressing as the making of modern India in this initiative, say the, the loose date from say 1900 to the year 2000, are there in your mind, to your mind, any uh, significant milestones that which could be people oriented or some could be just event led? Of course, uh, people and events are very closely related, but are there any significant milestones that come to your mind that uh, that impress upon you as milestones uh, in this hundred year span that has seen uh, a pre-independence India and post-independence India? Uh, the most important milestone, I've already touched upon this, the most important milestone that comes to mind almost immediately uh, is the efforts that were made by most of the makers of modern India to represent and champion the plurality of Indian society, the plurality of Indian cultures. That's why I said, you know, I always use the plural form instead of saying Indian culture. I mean, they, they did that with, some of them did that with great deal of elan as, as well, but most of them, even though those who could not aspire to the level of the elegance of a Gandhi, Tagore, or a Nehru, they also championed these ideas. Okay. Uh, and I think that's a very important landmark. And some of them, some of them were not front ranking leaders of quote unquote the national movement. Take somebody like Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. She becomes very important in the post 47 years. But before 47, she is just a second rank, if a second rank leader of within the Indian national movement, okay? She is part of that small ginger group that calls itself the Congress Socialist Party. Okay, but she's also doing many other things, uh, you know, uh, culturally, in the women's, move, women's movement, particularly, and so on. So I think, but all of them, in their various fora, in their various capacities, they are all promoting this idea of pluralism and of unity, that India is one country, one people. I think this is a very landmark development. This landmark development is shattered. And this is, I want to take this together. This landmark development is shattered because many of those who I called the front rank leaders compromise on this very idea that India is Indians and India is one unity when they agreed to agree to partition. And India's independence comes with division. It doesn't come with unity. The campaign for India's freedom was nonviolent, but India's freedom doesn't come with nonviolence. It comes with the most searing violence, communal riots, okay? The only front ranking leader who distances himself from all this is Gandhi. He's unable to accept that one of his aspirations, one of his dreams is being shattered before his eyes by the men that he himself has made. So Shudip, you will find that in 46, 47, much of Gandhi's time is spent in rural India, particularly in what is today Bangladesh, in the real poor parts of Eastern Bengal. He's not at the negotiating table talking to Wavell of Mountbatten. Most of the time he's not doing that, particularly after March or April 47, he's certainly not doing that, okay? He's gone, he's become a recluse on his own, he's in Noakhali. And 
The Bengali interpreter he took with him, uh, Nirmal Bose, who was a rather famous mm -hmm. anthropologist, okay, mm -hmm. records that in the hovel in which they lived, Gandhi, Nirmal Bose, and the stenographer, Parasuram, these are the only three people, two people Gandhi had with him. Okay, Nirmal Bose says, I often heard him pacing up and down in the middle of the night and muttering him to himself, kya karu? What do I do? So he's a lost soul. He's bewildered because the three most, four most important pillars of his sustenance have, are disappearing. Ahimsa is disappearing. Abhai is disappearing. Right? And Hindu-Muslim unity is disappearing. Three most important pillars of his sustenance are disappearing right before his eyes. So Gandhi, unable to accept this freedom that comes with partition, is not part of the celebrations of independence. He's not in Delhi. He's in a very poor suburb in Calcutta, in Belaghata. Okay? trying to bring back fearlessness, trying to boost morale among very poor Hindus and Muslims, encouraging them to live together just as they had lived together in the past. Okay, and when he's asked on the 15th of August, 1947 on that, on that morning, what is your message, Mr. Gandhi? I think it's the Reuters correspondent who asks him, what is your message, Mr. Gandhi? Today that India is free, what you had struggled for, he says, today is not a day for celebration. Today is a day for fasting and prayer. And I always tell myself that when, God, when Nehru makes that famous phrase and coins that undying, you makes that famous speech and coins that undying phrase, years ago we made a tryst with destiny. Okay, so we always quote, tryst with destiny. But I always ask myself, who constitutes that pronoun we? Who is Nehru talking about when he talks about we? Gandhi is certainly not part of that we. Agreed. Okay, neither are the millions of people who have been uprooted lost their property, lost their homes, have seen their brothers killed, fathers killed, wives, sisters raped, and so on and so forth. They are not part of the we. Yeah, but the point I'm trying to make here is that landmark also gets shattered. Okay, and that shattering, that trauma of that shattering still has not happened left us. We still live under the shadow of division. So when Nehru, in another of his famous speeches, on, in the evening or early evening of 30th of January 1948, when Mountbatten put him on top of a truck with a microphone to announce the death of Gandhi, when Nehru said, the light is out, you know, he was making a statement that went far beyond the context in which the statement was made. The light actually went out of India. Has, in some ways, uh, I mean, as seismic as this, these years were, and I mean, your, your exposition really brings it alive for us. Is there anything to your mind that uh, not comparable, but uh, milestone like, if you will, that we can reflect upon in post independence India that has brought us also to where we are today? I would say the defeat of Indira Gandhi in the post emergency election that is another moment of liberation for India because the emergency betrayed everything that Indian independence stood for and represented. Okay. 
there is a propensity, particularly among congressmen, to see the emergency as a minor blip. It wasn't. We underestimate the importance and the significance of the emergency. The way that the institutions of independent India were eroded, suborned, the bureaucracy, the judiciary, you know, actually left a major dent in the making of independent India. Freedom of speech. So, and then there was this moment of liberation when Mrs. Gandhi is roundly defeated. So the people of India actually triumph over her, if you like, that we do not, we did not like this. So I, 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 I think, I often think to myself that 1977, that election is India's second liberation, if you like. Well, the, the, the fun part about history, Professor, is that so all too often, uh, it seems that it brings with it a sense of deja vu. And uh, on that note, uh, may I thank you for joining us uh, and Live History India and the making of modern India. It's been absolutely delightful and so very educational and enlightening to speak to you. Thank you very much, Professor Mukherjee. Thank you, Shudip.